This morning's Torah portion is Noah. Does everybody know how to say Noah in Hebrew? Noah. Noah. Yeah, it's got that guttural het at the end of it. <laughs> we are told, as was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So we're going to look at some elements of what was happening in Noah's day that is happening again in our day that is not on the surface, it's not the obvious, it's something <coughs> hidden. Matthew 24, Yeshua speaks, saying, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. And that's kind of the way it is with us. We are going about our business and we don't know what day is that final day. We have to live each day as if it's our last. But Noah was faithful. While everybody else is living for themselves alone, Noah was following God's word. And for 120 years with his grandfather, Methuselah, he was telling the known world at that time what was to come. It was only in the last five years of the 120 year message that he started to build the ark and completed it just perfectly on time. He was faithful. So the faithfulness, like we talked about this morning, the imuna is more than just believing in God's word or in God. It's about being faithful to act. Remember James, Yaakov, Yeshua's brother, says faith without works is dead. If Noah had said, yes, I believe you, Lord, you're not only going to send the flood, but you're going to protect me, you're going to take care of me. But, and he didn't have a faith that works, he didn't prepare the ark, what would have happened? He would have been lost with everyone else. So we have to have a faith that works. And what's our ark today? What are we preparing for God's people? But realize this. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, that in the last days, difficult times are going to come. For men will be lovers of self. This is the core problem. This is the origins of sin. Lovers of money, boastful. They're going to become arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving irreconcilable. You ever had somebody that had an issue with you and no matter how much you did to appease them and to reconcile them, they wouldn't be reconciled. Malicious gossipers without self-control. They'll become brutal. Haters of the good that you're doing. They're going to become treacherous, even reckless and conceited. Con what's conceited? You think you know it all, right? Yeah. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men, or we could say mankind, men or women, as these. So we're going to see many elements of this Noah story, not just in the Torah, but in the prophets and in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament. Yes, Steve? Haters of good. That's the guy who wants to get you to, hey, come on, let's go drinking. I mean, if you really think about it, he wants you to bring you down to his level. That's the obvious uh, worldly way, but there's even a more subtle way. When you're doing good, there's those that will even be jealous of the good that you're doing, and they will become malicious gossipers behind the scene to destroy the good that you're doing. Yes. There's so much uh, to the spiritual realm that what we're seeing in the physical realm, like the obvious outward bad behavior, is only 3% of what's reality. That's why we have to put on the armor of God daily, because the majority, the 97% is in the spiritual realm. It's things that you're not going to see. It's not going to be obvious. But God is showing us such grace in our day today, in warning us, just like he warned Noah of what's to come. We know the seasons through his holy days that foreshadow not only his first coming, but his second coming and the wrath to come. And he shows us in his word. This morning's Torah portion is found in Genesis or Bereshit, the sixth chapter verse 9, and goes through chapter 11, verse 32. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there with me, because right from the end of last week's Torah portion, 
it carries into this week's Torah portion. Let's look back at verse 8 to get the context. We went from the story of creation and Adam and Eve and the fall of man to now this generation of Noah, as if, as if it's a completely separate story. It says, but Noah, amongst all the wickedness that had abounded in this world, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What's the Hebrew word for grace? Chen. So what's amazing is, here's Chen, Chet and Nun, so feet, right? Noach's name, then it says, here is the Toldot, the generation of Noach. Noach is Nun Chet. Grace is Chet Nun. It's just a reversal of Noah's name. And this is the first time that we see grace found in the Torah. Now people say, oh, grace is a New Testament concept. But grace is found right in the sixth chapter of Genesis, right in the beginning. I'll give you a little overview of the the chapters that we're going to look at and then we'll go through the parties so chapter six is going to go from the worldwide wickedness and the giant offspring of the watchers to the description of the flood in chapter seven and then chapter eight the end of the flood and chapter nine is going to be some new commandments introduced and the covenant that god renews with noah and there's that was on a particular holy day we're going to look at that and then the genealogy of the sons of Noah as they disperse around the earth after the flood in chapter 10. And in chapter 11, the worldwide language and government in Babylon and the genealogy from Adam down through that day. So every week we kind of break down the Torah portion into what we call the parties. This is the word that you get paradise from. It is like a garden of deeper meanings. And in the Peshat, that's the surface, the literal meaning. That's that 3% that you see, which looks like the story of the age of Noah and the flood. But then we go a little bit deeper into the Ramez, just uh, beyond the literal. And there's three things that we like at the Assembly of Called Out Believers to bring out in every Torah portion. We like to see what does this Torah portion specifically tell us about God's character. And we see right off the bat, it's grace. The grace of God as a savior to save mankind, even in the midst of all of the wickedness, he's seeking to save his bride. And then we look for hidden glimpses of Messiah. And we know that through Messiah, we are saved by Chen, right? We are saved by Chen through Imuna. We are saved by grace through faith. And so we can even see Messiah as the ark, as the savior, as the one who carries us through the floodwaters of trials and tribulations and destruction around us. And so how do we apply this to our day? Noah, he was faithful, right? He put his faith into action. God told him to tell the world, to preach for 120 years, and he did this. And at the end of 120 years, Methuselah died just a couple months before the flood. And then, um, of course, five years before the flood, he started building the ark. And he put that faith into further action by not just speaking it, but by doing it. And this is like our spiritual walk. First, we hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And we put that, which we hear, into telling others. We become a conduit of the Torah. We become living Torahs, and we share it with others, and then we do it. So this Torah becomes written on our heart. So this is the application for us to think about today. What are we facing? What is to come? The destruction of the world, but not by water this time, but by fire. And how are we going to prepare people to be saved? And then in the drosh, we seek deeper comparisons amongst the Hebrew letters. This is one of the few Torah portions that does not have an enlarged letter or a small letter or dots. So we don't have any uh, hidden anomalies, but we've got lots of symbolism, including the gematria. The gematria we will look at in Noah. The noon, remember what uh, value the noon has? Has a value of 50. And the chet, is the eighth letter of the alphabet, and so it's got a value of eight. So Noah and Grace would both have a gematria of 58, and we're going to look at what other words give us deeper meaning into that by the gematria. And 
we're going to look at some of the further explanations of this time period in Enoch 7 and Jubilees 6 and 7, and then we'll close with our Hoff Torah seeing even Noah mentioned in the prophets by Isaiah in chapter 54. So, very first thing, Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. We've talked about what that fear is. It's holy awe, right? It's infatuation with God. I love God so much, I'm going to follow Him wherever He goes, and whatever He says, I'm going to trust Him. And so it's, He was moved. When you have that kind of trust in uh, someone, you not only don't take your eyes off them, but you believe everything they're saying. It says, by faith, moved with that holy awe, he prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Now, last week, the bait was enlarged. It was all about God creating this house for his bride and for him to dwell in. This is going to be the center of all cosmic worship after the millennial reign. So this is all about his house, but something crept in and destroyed his house, destroyed his bride who was made in his image. We're going to look at that aspect hidden in the Hebrew. By which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So we even see righteousness by faith in the Torah, which is beautiful. Even Abraham had righteousness by faith. It says even before it was written, Abraham kept all of the Torah and the Mishpatim and the judgments. Yes, Mark? Yeah, I just want to point out the fact that he became heir of the righteousness because he had prepared an ark, because he was doing what Yahweh had told him. Yes. Wasn't so much because he condemned the world. That's right. It was in the doing of building the ark that he condemned the world. But it was because he had followed what Yahweh had told him. Amen. That's exactly right. And like you had said earlier about, you know, whatever Yahweh's ark is for each one of us today. Mm -hmm. What is he calling you to do to prepare for the things that are to come? We have to be wise and we have to put our faith into action. Because righteousness, like Mark is saying, is right doing. Right? Now, we don't judge wrongly. We don't condemn. That's not right doing. Right doing is li being living Torahs, being the light to the people and preparing for the people. Very good point, Mark. So we find that Noah was saved by grace. People think that this is something new. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Noah found Chen, grace, in the eyes of the Lord we just read. And by grace you are saved through faith, and that it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2.8 Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So we talked about this gematria of 58. Here it is again with hen, meaning favor, grace, kindness. Did you know that the word gadol yahu, God is great, is 58? Very interesting. Gives you a little deeper because what is grace? What is so great about God? He gives you what you don't deserve. And he doesn't give you what you do deserve. <laughs> the wrong things. I'll put it like this. Grace is when you get the good things you don't deserve. Okay? Now, none of us deserved eternal life, right? We've all fallen short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he has made a way for us to receive it. What is mercy? When you're spared from the bad things that you do deserve. There's natural cause and effect in this world, in this environment. And through Yeshua, he has taken the ultimate cause and effect, which is eternal separation from God, upon himself. This is mercy. Isn't that beautiful? God is great, 58. He shows his grace, and he is great because he's generous with both. So we get a hidden glimpse. In Hebrew, one Hebrew word that has a gematria or a value to another word that seemingly is unrelated you have to dig deeper. If they equal the same value, there's a lesson, a deeper lesson in it. So let's read on. Here is the history, it probably says in your Bibles, of Noah. In Hebrew, this is toldot. We have a Torah portion. It's the sixth Torah portion in the year, toldot, about Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebekah, and it means generations, right? So here is the generation of Noah. Then, what does your Bible say? 
what's the next word? In his generation. It uses generation again. But in Hebrew, it's a totally different word. So we're missing something. What are we missing? The word is bedorotav. And the root word is dor, okay? Dor is like a revolution. It's something that is living. It's something that is within time. And it's something that is kind of spiraling and gyrating. What does this sound like? In his, we, we might call it a lineage. Or we might even call it uh, DNA. In his DNA, Noah was righteous. So this is an issue of not just outward wickedness, but something that's going on within. Noah was a man, in Hebrew we would say a tzaddik. He was an uh, ish tzaddik. Tamim. Halakha. What does this mean? He was not only a righteous man, but tamim means completely walking with God or um, in his ways, in his being, he was completely still in the image of God. So here it is in Hebrew. Elech todot Noach. Here's the generation of Noach. Noach ish zadik tamim. Noah's a man, righteous, he's a righteous zadik, completely, tamim. Then it says, haya Bedorotav et ha Elohim ha tahalach noach. Halach is the word we get halacha from. It is what we call the Jewish laws that we live by. They're God's laws, but the Jews are the ones that have preserved them. We call it halacha. This is the root word right here. Noah was basically living exactly the way God told him to live, and in so including who he would marry, and this is what preserved him and his lineage to be saved. It preserved their DNA from the hybrid DNA that the Watchers had infused before the flood. It goes on, verse 10. Noah fathered three sons. So now it's not only talking about the outward, but it's continuing this DNA, this pure DNA. Shim, which means name. Ham, which means hot. Ham is that guttural, that het. And Yepheth. Now Yepheth means to expand into open areas. And we know Yepheth expanded up into the north, which is now European uh, northern area. And the earth was corrupted. This word is very important to understand because... Many times we think of corrupt just in the sense of you do wrong, right? So you're a corrupt person because you cheated somebody. But this has a much deeper connotation. It was corrupted. The DNA was ruined. And this word is shahat. And shahat is used not only like in the context of something is corrupted, but even later on when you see that God says, I'm going to, in the English it, it says, destroy the world. It's not destroy as in kill the creation that he made. It's as in he's going to ruin, he's going to shakha the shakha. He's going to ruin those that are already ruined by the corrupted DNA. This is what's so beautiful about understanding the Hebrew. God's not a killer. He's not killing his creation just because they erred. He's in the business of saving. He is allowing to be ruined the, those that have ruined DNA through the Watcher's hybrid species. So it says, I will point it out every time this comes up, because it's going to come up like six times in the next couple of verses, this shakha. The earth was ruined, and I'll just say ruined in the English so that you can get the context. The earth was ruined before God. The earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and yes, it was ruined. For all living beings had ruined their ways. That door upon the earth, that DNA, had been ruined. This word here, their ways, is darho. It has that same root dar in it, which connotates to... If you think of a dalit, what does a dalit look like? Right? And it represents a door. And then you have... This is the word door. What's the resh? It's a person, right? It's not just any person. It's like a princely person. 
So literally, the DNA is the door to the person. This is what had been ruined. And the earth had become full of violence. And all living beings had become ruined in their ways on the earth, in their door. And we remember Matthew. It reminds me when he says, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence and by force. This is what that corrupt DNA seeks to do. Instead of being humble and submitting to God's ways, it wants what God has. It wants to be like God, but it doesn't submit to God. So it tries to take it by force. This is the same way that this, these beings were before the flood. God said to Noah, The end of all living beings has come before me. For because of them, the earth is filled with violence. I will destroy, and this word here, shaka again, I will ruin those who are ruined, basically, in the earth. Now this brings on a whole different context, because if we see God as a destroyer of just those that have sinned or those that have done wrong, then it taints our view of who God is, what his character is like. But if we understand that the whole world was ruined to the point where if time had been allowed to continue, all flesh would be ruined. He wouldn't have a bride left. He's actually doing a saving act by allowing to be ruined those who have already been ruined. Same way in the last days. God says, if time were not shortened, no flesh would survive. So we have to think of God as being a savior in this, showing grace. He's not arbitrarily killing. He is allowing to be ruined those who are already ruined. They're not even in his image any longer. And we're going to find out a little bit what they were like. Now God said to Noah, and we read this in uh, Jubilees, chapter 7, that Noah and Methuselah preached repentance and for the people to return for 120 years. But no one repented and no one returned. I'm going to turn there really quick just to share with you this amazing depiction in Jubilees chapter 7. It says, For owing to these three things came the flood. The verse before it talks about fornication, uncleanness, and iniquity. Because the angels fornicated with the men. And that caused uncleanness in the image of God and iniquity. It says, For owing to these three things the flood came upon the earth, namely owing to the fornication wherein the watchers against the Torah of their ordinances, so they have instruction that they're supposed to watch men, help men, but they're not supposed to... Um, engage in a cross-species um, union. They, the watchers, went to whoring after the daughters of men and took themselves women of all that they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanness. And they begat sons called the Nephilim, and they were all unalike, and they devoured one another. The great giants, there were three generations. The first generation was called the great giants. They slew the Nephilim. And the Nephilim slew the Eloi, the third generation. And the Eloi were slain mankind and one another. And they couldn't be fed enough. It was totally a self-indulgent um, society of these huge giants to the point where they started eating men and cannibalizing one another, even one giant to another. This is why one of the very first Noahide laws after the flood God says, do not eat blood. Do not take any blood into your bodies. Everyone sold himself to work iniquity and to shed much blood in those days. And the earth was filled with iniquity. And after this, they sinned even against the beast and the birds and all that moves. So they were genetically modifying and, and changing even the way God had created the animals. And every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. And the Lord destroyed, he ruined everything that was already ruined from off the face of the earth because of the wickedness of their deeds and because of the blood which they had shed in the midst of the earth. And everything was destroyed. 
And we were left, I and you, my sons, and everything that entered with us into the ark. And behold, I see your works before me, that you do not walk in righteousness. For the path of destruction you have begun to walk, and you are parting one from another, and are envious of one another. And so comes disharmony. So this is after the flood. Noah's talking to his sons, and he's saying, listen, there was a certain way that things were before the flood. And even though God has instructed you in his ways, you're starting to now turn from them. And he had to remind them of what three things caused the flood. Do not engage in these three things. So, let's see. If I have a slide. This is a slide of some of the giants that have been unearthed by archaeologists. These are only giants that cropped up after the flood through the dormant DNA of Ham's wife and their sons. They had four sons, which were Canaan, uh, Cush, Put, and Mitzrayim. And out of each of these cultures, of course, we know the Canaanites, there was giants, right? And the Philistines down in Mitzrayim, that was Egypt, there was giants that arose. All of these giants after the flood were anywhere from between 15 feet and 36 feet. But before the flood, the great giants were 450 feet. This is the stuff that Jack and the Beanstalk, these folklore, were made of. And the Nephilim were like 300 feet. They were a little smaller. And the Eloi were a little smaller than them. That's why each one was preying upon the other. And the Eloi would prey upon the sons of men. They were the ones that were cannibalizing men. But this just puts it into perspective. Because sometimes people think that these things are fables. And they really don't go into the depth of what the scripture is talking about. Of how this DNA from the Watchers brought forth a whole species of giants and hybrid beings. Here's uh, one archaeologist. You can see the size of the skull compared to almost the size of a whole man here. Here's another one clearing out. Look at the size of this skull. Bigger than this archaeologist. Here's another one. I like this picture because it's interesting. He wasn't only buried during the time of the flood and holding on to a bowl here, uh, but look at his fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six, counting his thumb. This is indicative of the hybrid species from the Watchers. They would have six fingers, six toes. It was said of um, Goliath and his brothers that they had 24 digits altogether. So, six on this hand, six on this hand, six on this foot, six on this foot. Isaac? Yes? There was a report just recently from Afghanistan of troops uh, being killed and then killing a man who was extremely large, and they shoved him away in a... Very quiet. The first group of special forces were wiped out by him. Right. And yes, and the second group, after killing him and coming prepared, um, when they explored that cave, they found that he was also cannibalistic, yes. that there was human bones from many, many years, and he was a red haired uh, big giant. Yeah, and that, they kept that undercover as well. They don't want this knowledge to get out, they want you to believe that this is uh, well, just stories. Yes. Like all things that the Smithsonian or the government gets involved with, these things disappear and all of a sudden there's no more evidence. And so the same way with all these um, giant bones that they got pictures of while they were unearthing them, once the government gave Smithsonian the rights over these bones and over, there's different graves all around the earth, including the mounds in Ohio and all of this. But whenever these things come out and they're supposedly getting shipped to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., Mysteriously, they disappear, or the ship, you know, sinks, or so they're just suppressing the knowledge. So it says, God told Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. You're to make the ark with rooms and cover it with pitch, both outside and inside. And here's how you're to build it. And he gave specific blueprints. The ark is to be 450 feet, and its width is 75 feet. Well, the first thing that jumped out at me is 75 is exactly one-sixth of 450. So this is an even proportion, the width to the depth. They found that this is the most stable kind of freighter ship that can withstand the big uh, waves of the ocean, um, this, this model. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and its height is 45 feet tall. Now, 45 is exactly one-tenth of its length. 
So you've got a width that's one sixth exactly and a, and a height that's one tenth. It's like only God who knows all the laws of the physical universe knows how to perfectly put a perfect bobber in the water that all of the fountains of the great deep bursting forth and all of the fountains of the heavens of the water the canopy collapsing could not sink this ship. Yes, Steve? And, uh, we've always heard these arguments against the this ship having enough space to handle all the animals of our planet. But I raised pheasant and I found that one species of pheasant would actually breed out two other species. Mm -hmm. So we probably had one pair of dogs. One species of each. That's right. Like that. yeah. Very good and point. There was an archaeologist, um, I forget his last name, Bob Con. <laughs> Cornuke, right? Cornuke, yeah. He, um, after doing a little more in-depth study as to the original Ararat range, because it doesn't say the mountain of Ararat, it says the mountains of Ararat. He realized that the ancient mountain range of Ararat was not in Turkey, but more in northeast Iran and uh, much higher range. Instead of Mount Ararat being 7,000 feet, this range is 15,000 feet at its peak. And they found an altar up at the, the top, uh, some old you know, particles of petrified wood up there. Noah was to build an altar. Where would he built it? Right up at the top. And um, they found this uh, ark and brought back um, specimens of the petrified wood from it. And supposedly, the story that I heard was even a horsehair. And they had it tested, and all the species, like Steve is saying, uh, from all the species of horses, all the different kinds, uh, come back to that one horse. So, in that one origin. So, we'll look at uh, here's. Uh, one place where they think that it possibly could be the walls. Now we're told that Noah took the canopy off and when he left. He didn't open up the door like he went in. Apparently he undid the roof and came, you know started to undo things. So this is looking like the hall here. You can kind of see the shape of what a boat would look like. You know, Isaac, yes. Uh, Bob Cornu speaking at the Konania House. Uh, they have a conference every year in Idaho. And so he'd be one of the speakers at, at the end of this month. I think it's, I don't you, Please send me that information, if you will. Please send me that information. It'd be great to take a trip over there with anybody else who would be interested in hearing that. Uh, years ago, I was invited to be a part of the archaeological um, group that was searching on Mount Ararat with Dr. Ba, but the government closed down the visas, and so it, it didn't end up happening. But I've always been interested in proving Bible and science together. He says you're to make an opening for daylight in the ark 18 inches below the roof covering. Put a door in its side and build it with lower, second, and third decks. Then I myself will bring the flood of water over the earth to shaka, to ruin again those which were ruined from under heaven. Every living thing that breathes, everything on the earth will be ruined. But I will establish my covenant with you. You will come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. From every living thing, from each kind of living being and species, you are to bring two into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They are to be male and female. Of each kind of bird, each kind of livestock, and each kind of animal creeping on the ground, two are to come to you so that they can be kept alive. Also take from all kinds of food that are eaten and collect for yourself. It is to be food for you and for them. So they literally had a floating greenhouse. They were keeping also certain vegetation to feed the animals and themselves. This is what Noah did. He did all that God ordered him to do. Also, in this chapter 7 now, he adds to that, in addition to a male and female of every species, I want you to bring in seven of every clean animal. Now this is before the Torah is written, so if anybody thinks that what we call kashrut, the laws of kosher animals, kosher eating, clean food, clean animals, uh, is something new or something Jewish, 
it goes all the way back to the beginning. Noah only knew what he knew because of what had been passed down from Adam. So do you know that Adam lived 930 years to the days of when Noah's father was about 45, 50 years old roughly. So Noah had direct access, in addition to Enoch and Methuselah still living, Lamech personally knew Adam, and this knowledge would have been passed down about all the Torah, but at that time it's only oral, nothing's written down. Enoch was the first one to write anything down. Chapter 7, Adonai says to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone in this generation are righteous before me. Of every clean animal, you are to take seven couples. Of the animals that are not clean, one couple. Also of the birds of the air, seven couples, in order to preserve their species throughout the earth. For in seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. I will wipe out every living thing that I have made from the face of the earth. Noah did all that Adonai ordered him to do. And Noah was 600 years old when the waters flooded the earth. Noah went into the ark with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives because of the flood waters. Of the clean animals, of animals that are not clean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, couples, males and female, all went into the ark with Noah as God had ordered them. After seven days, the waters flooded the earth. So they're inside the ark for seven days with the door shut and no rain is coming. You ever felt like God told you to do something and then it doesn't happen immediately and you second guess yourself and you doubt? <laughs> this is what Noah must have been going through. But then you have that big confirmation, that first drip, drip, drip on the ceiling. They've never seen rain before. It says, the day that the water started flooding the earth was the 17th day of the second month of the 600th year of Noah's life. Why is this significant? I'm going to go back a couple chapters in the book of Jubilees and read something from chapter 3. Now, what's amazing, the Torah is like an outline of God's instruction to us, but there's many spots that come through other people, other passages that give us the details of how to live out the Torah. In chapter 3 of Jubilees, chapter uh, verse 18, it's speaking of the fall of man when Eve was first beguiled by the serpent. And it says, after the completion of seven years in the garden, which he had completed there, seven years exactly, it was in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that the serpent came and deceived Eve. So the day that the flood began is the exact same day that sin entered in the world. And what is the flood doing but cleansing the sin when it's reached a apex, when it's reached a point at which no flesh would survive, God steps in when there's only one family left on the exact day that sin crept in, very symbolic, he cleanses the earth of sin. It was on that day that all the fountains of the deep were broken up. And we talked last week about how on the second day, God separated the waters that were covering the earth to the waters above, and he called it the firmament, and the waters below he called the seas. And there was a hidden prophecy in that second day, because it was in the second millennial day, right in the midst, from 1,000 years to 2,000 years after creation, it was right in the midst of that second millennial day that those waters came crashing back together. The fountains of the deep burst forth, and the canopies of heaven collapsed on this exact day. And it rained on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that same day, Noah entered the ark with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife, and three wives of his sons accompanying them. They and every animal of every species, all the livestock of every species, every animal that creeps on the ground of every species, and every bird of every species, all sorts of winged creatures. They went into to Noah in the ark. They weren't afraid of Noah. You know, before the flood, men and animals cohabitated in such a way that it was only after the flood that God put fear in them because he knew that men were going to start hunting animals more than they did before the flood. It was in the early days, man could even communicate with animals. This is why it was no surprise for Eve to hear a serpent speaking to her. All the animals, when Adam named them, understood the name which he gave them and uh, the communication that they had. So these animals went right into Noah. It's interesting that it didn't just say that they went into the ark. They went into Noah personally in the ark. 
couples from every kind, kind of like presenting themselves before Adam for a name. They presented themselves before Noah. Where would you have me in this <laughs> big ship? You want me to go in that bin or that stall or that perch? So they present themselves before Noah. Couples from every kind of living thing that breathes. Those that entered went in, male and female, from every kind of living being as God had ordered him. And Adonai shut him inside. Now the flood was 40 days on the earth, and the water grew higher and higher and floated the ark, so that it was lifted up off the earth. And the water continued to overflow the earth and grew deeper and deeper until the ark floated on the surface of the water. And the water overpowered the earth mightily, and all the high mountains under the entire sky were covered. The water covered the mountains by more than 22 and a half feet. So the tallest mountain, not saying that Everest existed at that time, most likely that was caused by the flood, you know, the continental shelves and the tectonic plates, but whatever the tallest mountain was, the water covered it by 22 and a half feet. All living beings that moved on the earth perished, birds, livestock, and other animals, insects, and every human being, everything in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. Whatever was on dry land died. He wiped out every living thing on the surface of the ground, not only human beings, but livestock, creeping animals, and birds of the air. This reminds us of the seventh plague. You know, there's six plagues that the saints go through, right up to the point where all the armies of the earth are gathered against Jerusalem in the sixth plague. And it's in the midst of the sixth plague that Mashiach comes. The seventh plague is what the saints don't experience. That is what's called the indignation or the wrath of God. That's a hundred pound hail coming down, fire, earthquake that destroys every living thing. And so this is very likened to the seventh plague reference in the last days even to the point where then it says the waters held power over the earth for 150 days if you look at revelation there's something significant about 150 days right before or at the time of the sixth plague right before mashiach comes there's 150 days that men are tormented you remember that five months it was five months that the the uh waters were literally just you know they were in the ark and they were floating in these waters 40 days that it actually rained and then they're in there for another five months after that god remembered noah yes um ken holman showed that if you took a like basketball sized earth and you took a tablespoon of water he would cover it it would cover it and cover everything when it's it perfectly it. round and there's not these uh yeah. yeah. It's not hard to imagine this happening. No, not at all. And even in the creation account that we read of last week, you know, when God separates the waters and he calls dry land to appear, all it takes is you taking some of this earth, you know, if it's a perfect globe, and you put it over on this side, and then you're going to have the chasms of the deep and the sea for the fish, and you're going to have dry land appear for vegetation to grow. So yeah, once you understand the mechanics of creation and the <laughs> physics of the universe, it's uh, very realistic. It's not uh, a fable or a story. Yes, Jimmy. Being ex Coast Guard, I know that who else would have been more of like a, the inspector to make sure the vessel was even seaworthy to begin with? So, of course, he was already on there waiting. So, when the vessel was to start floating, I'm sure he was, all right, it's good to go. See ya. That's right. <laughs> That's, and Noah, imagine, it only told us the length, the width, and the height, right? How many other details? Any of you that have been in building business, you know there's a lot of specs, right? A lot of details. Where are those details? They were orally given, right? The, uh, the Torah is just giving us an outline of what was given. So there's so many more details that we have to be open to understanding that these patriarchs and prophets, they had so much more knowledge than what we're given. We're just given the surface story right now. Chapter 8. God remembered Noah and every living thing of all the livestock with him in the ark. So God caused a wind to pass over the earth. And the waters begin to go down. You know, when he brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea, there was a wind that opened up the waters. And the prophets liken it to the breath of his nostrils blowing this water aside. Also, the fountains of the deep and the windows of the sky were stopped. 
The rain from the sky was restrained, and the water came back from completely covering the earth. It was after 150 days that the waters subsided and started to go down. On the 17th day, whenever a date is given, we have to find the significance of this date, right? Why did he perfectly explain? So like we found out what the second month and the 17th day means. In verse 4, the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. What's significant about this day? It's within the holy days, yes. It is within the Feast of Sukkot. The seventh month is Tishri. The 17th day is two days after Sukkot begins. What does Sukkot represent? Living in temporary dwellings. God providing for us. When our ancestors were brought through the wilderness, we lived in temporary dwellings, right? And God provided. Noah is in a temporary dwelling, and God is providing for him. Yes, Archie? This, this would have been uh, first fruits, which would have been the month of Nisan. No, you know, many people have speculated that because later when God brings them out, the, he takes the first month being Aviv, right? And he says, this shall be the first month for you. God is speaking to Moses, who knows the um, these proper calendar already. So he's already given Moses. Remember, Moses is writing this account in Genesis. So Moses is actually giving this with the understanding that we have. So the seventh month is the seventh month, not the first, like we have speculated uh, in the past. We used to think, this is before the Exodus, so God must be speaking to him with Tishri being the first month and uh, Nisan or Aviv being the sixth month. But then when you correlate it and you realize when he came out of the ark, Noah, and this is confirmed by the Dead Sea Scrolls, came out of the ark just before Shavuot, and he built the altar and made the same sacrifices that we are told to make on Shavuot, on the Holy Day, in the third month. And he relates it as the third month. So we have to realize that he's relating this story with the religious calendar, starting in Aviv. So it begins on the 15th day, then, of, of uh, Tishri. That's right. So... It was the 17th day. It is a week-long feast. It's in the midst. That's correct, but what's the significance of 17 days? It's just in the midst of... And uh, it lasts for seven days. The whole feast is a week long, so it's in the midst of that feast. That's the significance of it. It's right in that holy day of... I mean, the holy feast of Sukkot is a week long, and it's in the second day of that feast. Then you're going to see, I'm going to bring out the exact um, calculations for Shavuot in a few more verses. Yes, Mark? Yeah. <clears throat> Just one other point about that. This is also the, uh, the real evidence that we have. We have uh, five months of 30 days, because it's 750 days. Yes. And so the only calendar that we know of that has five consecutive 38 months is the 360, which is what all the prophets had utilized. Yes, and that we utilize to unlock prophecy as well. Very good. These are all great things that you can extrapolate from a seemingly story about the flood. There's so much more deep knowledge to extract. So the waters kept going down until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen. After another 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had built. And he sent out a raven which flew back and forth until the waters dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the waters had gone down from the surface of the ground. But the dove found no place for her feet to rest, so she returned to him in the ark, because the water still covered the earth. He put out his hand, he took her and brought her in to him in the ark. And he waited another seven days, and again sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came, came into him in the evening, and there in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Now, what's the olive tree represent in prophecy? Israel. Yes. So here's a little glimpse of why God is restoring, or not only preserving Noah, it's for his bride in Israel. You're seeing a little glimpse of Israel being preserved. This Israel is in seed form in Noah's loins, in essence. Through Noah's son Shem become all the Shemitic tribes. So even this is a little glimpse that Israel is being looked at. He's the apple. Israel is the apple of God's eye. So he waits and 
until this dove comes back with this olive leaf and then he knew that the water had cleared from the earth and he waited another seven days and he sent out the dove again and when she didn't return he knew it was okay to leave the ark so this was on the first day of the first month so this is the new year aviv one this is where we search for the aviv barley is it green in the ear and of course Noah's the first green thing that he sees is this olive leaf now what holy day is in the um, in the first month Passover yes the enemy desires to destroy us but through the blood of the lamb which is our covering he cannot touch us right here it's at the very time of Passover that he sees this water drying up from the earth so Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and yes the surface of the ground was dry and on the 27th day of the second month so now you've got almost two months that have passed from the first of Aviv he's still living in the ark they're not leaving yet then he sees that it was dry so God says to Noah go out from the ark your wife your sons and your son's wives with you what day was this that God said to go out from the ark if you look back at Jubilees chapter 6 verse 11 it says on this account he spoke to you that you should make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain see notice Noah's upon the mountain and he's making covenant with Noah he renewing that covenant with an oath it says that you should sprinkle blood upon them because of all the words of the covenant which Yahweh made with them forever and this testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beast or birds of cattle during all the days of the earth and the man who eats the blood of beast or of cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land and do you command the children of Israel to eat no blood so that their names and their seed this DNA may be preserved because it's through the transference of blood that we take on other contaminants and as for this Torah there is no limit of days it is forever they shall observe it throughout their generations so that they might continue supplicating on your behalf every day and at the time of morning and evening they shall seek forgiveness this is the establishment of the evening and the morning sacrifices perpetually before the Lord that they might keep it and not be rooted out and he gave to Noah and his sons a sign and that there should be never again a flood on the earth and he set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should not be again a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth for this reason it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should celebrate the feast of Shavuot in the third month once a year at the to renew the covenant every year so even in the book of Jubilees it's likening Noah's flood and the renewal of the covenant with the rainbow on Shavuot and we see proof that Noah came out of the flood just days before Shavuot in time to build an altar and to go and collect uh, the firewood and to, um, to sacrifice the animals in time for Shavuot in Exodus 19 11 it says that it was in the new moon of the third month and so we know Shavuot is usually around the sixth of uh, Sivan so here Noah comes out of the ark on what's What's that? Shavuot? Oh, Pentecost? Yeah, because a lot of us are still learning. Okay. <laughs> yes, Shavuot is that festival where God renews covenant with man. And we see it from Noah's day. And we see Isaac was born as the child of promise on Shavuot. And then we see the Ten Commandments given on Mount Sinai. God, it always has to do with a mountain. Isaac was taken up to a mountain. The ark settled on a mountain. The covenant was renewed with Israel on a mountain, Mount Sinai. And and where was all of the apostles 2000 years ago up upon mount zion in one accord unified when the spirit of god descended like flames of fire and they heard many voices and each one in their own language this is all a renewal of this covenant on this specific day the only way that you're going to experience the blessing of that is if you are gathered together with the body and you're in unity 
This is why it was specific in the New Testament that it says, and they were all of one accord. It's showing their, their unification. So when we read this verse in verse 15 in Genesis 8, that God told Noah to go out from the ark, we know, according to Jubilee 6 and Exodus 19, 11, that this was on the new moon of the third month, and then it was only a handful of days after that that Shavuot uh, was observed by Noah. He says, Bring out with you every living thing that you have with you, birds, livestock, and every animal that creeps on the earth, so that, you can, so that they can swarm on the earth, be fruitful, and multiply. This is a commandment that was given back at creation. He's just reiterating it because it's like a renewal, a restart. So Noah went out with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, whatever moves on the earth according to their families. They went out of the ark. Now Noah built an altar, and we know that this was for Shavuot to Adonai. Then he took from every clean animal and every clean bird, and he offered burnt offerings. Now you see how the Torah doesn't tell you that it was Shavuot. So you have to dig a little bit deeper. And this is why it's so important to restore these books that the Essenes preserved that were originally considered scripture. They knew. The, the patriarchs and the prophets knew that this was talking about Shavuot. But for the last 2,000 years, you know, there's been a consorted effort to remove the knowledge from these books. And to, because what is knowledge but power, right? And so it's important for us. That's why we love restoring the books of the Dead Sea Scrolls because you get so much more of the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Adonai smelled the sweet aroma, and Adonai said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, since the imaginings of a person's heart are evil from his youth. Nor will I ever again ruin all living things as I have done. So long as the earth exists, sowing time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. Then God blessed Noah. He renewed his covenant with him and his sons, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. This is the very first mitzvah from creation, reiterated here. And fill the earth, and the fear of and dread of you, mankind, will be upon every wild animal now. Every bird in the air, every creature populating the ground, and all flesh, I mean all fish in the seas, they have been handed over to you. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you, just as I gave you green plants before. So now I give you everything, only flesh with its life, with its blood you are not to eat. I will certainly demand an account for the blood of your lives. I will demand it from every animal and from every human being. I will demand it from every human being on accounting of the life of his fellow human being. Whoever sheds human blood by a human being, will his own blood be shed? This is an early way to say he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. There's cause and effect. Yes, Mark. Verse 3, he doesn't say anything about fruit. He just says the animal and the green herb. Yeah, green plants. Which is interesting because it was the fruit that caused Adam to get drunk. <laughs> in that you mean Noah. Because you cannot ferment anything in any diluvian environment. It wasn't until after. Right. Things don't last so long without the double atmospheric pressure and oxygen. Right. And so Noah's grape juice that might have lasted a lot longer before the flood all of a sudden has a lot more intoxication after the flood. Because he wasn't uh, one prone to gluttony. He wasn't a person that would get drunk. He was a righteous Zadik. So this was something that happened accidentally, but he didn't realize what all of that had changed due to the flood. So consequently, he wasn't saying that he couldn't have fruit. Right. He's just prescribing the food specifically. Because it's much better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So then... God speaks to Noah in verse 8 of chapter 9, and he says to him and his sons, As for me, I am herewith establishing my covenant with you. This is on Shavuot. With your descendants also after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the livestock and the animals all going out from the ark, every animal on the earth, I will establish my covenant with you, that never again will all living beings be destroyed by the waters of a flood, and there will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. 
God added, Here is the sign of the covenant I am making between myself and you and every living creature with you for all generations to come. I am putting my rainbow in the clouds. It will be there as a sign of the covenant. And you know this rainbow, this sign of the covenant, only shows up when it's starting to rain. So if anybody did have any intrinsic fear, it would be a type of peaceful reminder that God is not going to destroy the earth with a flood. In Revelation, it says the enemy seeks to destroy God's people with a flood. Remember it said, out of the dragon's mouth poured a flood after the woman and after her seed. And in Bible prophecy, waters represent peoples, nations, and tongues. So even you could draw a correlation with the five months that the waters are um, over the earth, that there will be five months where the waters represent the final persecuting power seeking to persecute God's people. So there's a lot of analogies that you could even draw out prophetically here. He says in verse 13, I'm putting my rainbow in the clouds. It's going to be a sign of the covenant between myself and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow is seen in the cloud, I will remember my covenant, which is between myself and you. God is so good. He's showing his grace once again and even caring for our emotional state in comforting us after such a traumatic event. And every living creature of any kind and the water will never again become a flood to destroy all living beings. The rainbow will be in the cloud so that when I look at it, interesting, who's talking here? The word of God. So when the word looks at the cloud, I will remember the everlasting covenant between God, so the word is talking, <laughs> and every living creature. All of a sudden this word creeps in and it's like an intermediary. I'm going to remember the covenant between God and his people. This I, it's as if it's a third party. <coughs> no, it speaks in the first person all of a sudden. The rainbow will be in the cloud so that when I look at it, I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on the earth. So is it talking about mankind looking at it? Or when it's saying when I, it's this word of God speaking. Yeah, and man is included in every living creature. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between myself and every living creature on the earth. The sons of Noah who went out from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. He was also the father of Put and Lud and Mitzrayim. These three were the sons of Noah, and the whole earth was populated by these three sons. Noah, a farmer, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank so much of the wine that he got drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father exposed, and he went out. Now, he didn't mock his father, but he went out and did something wrong. The very first thing that you do if you see something that's wrong is you help the person in need, right? He went out and he talked about it. This is one of the most destructive characteristics in mankind since the, not only the fall, but the flood. Ham went out and he started laughing about it or talking about it to his uh, other brothers. Shem and Yapheth took a cloak and he, they both put it over their shoulders and to show respect, they walked backwards and went in and laid the cloak over their father's naked body so that they would not see it. Because in Torah, you're not supposed to look at the naked body of your parents. So they're even observing Torah in doing this beautiful act. Ham, he goes out and gossips about it instead. Shem and Yapheth took a... Um, their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father lying there exposed. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his young his son had done to him. Now it's interesting. It says done to him. It's just like character assassination. When you talk or gossip about somebody, you're doing something to them. Yeshua took it a step further. He says, if you have an issue in your heart against a brother, you know, or if you're angry with your brother, it's the same as murder that log in our own eye that we're supposed to take out before we try to judge the log or the speck in the brother's eye, it really comes to mind with that right there. And it's really cool that I, I liked this part, if I could just share, 
um, you're getting right up to the part where you know Ham was cursed mm -hmm. from this act or what he did, and uh, this is kind of what the Lord was showing me in, in uh, this part of this portion because it bothered me that um, that Ham reacted the way he did. And yes, well, he went and he gossiped and he talked. Father showed me the behavior in that. What was it that caused him? To have the behavior mm -hmm. that was less than respectful according to uh, what the other brothers did. But what Noah does when he curses uh, the act, he doesn't curse Ham himself. Exactly. He curses the offspring through this uh, wife of Ham's and he says, cursed be Canaan. Now, he doesn't say anything about Canaan going in and um, seeing Noah naked. But Noah knew something. Cursed be Canaan, he will be a servant of servants to his brothers. Then he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of Shem. Canaan will be their servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And this is actually what Japheth means, is enlarged. Canaan is one of those cultures that giants spring up in very soon. And this is why Canaan actually took the inheritance of Shem, which was the land of Israel, and was residing in it. And his giants were flourishing there. And this is why when Israel comes back from Egypt, it's Canaanites who live there. And the giants are in the land. And we're like grasshoppers to them. So we can see all of this in this curse uh, that Noah prophetically spoke against his grandson. And we know even the sins of the fathers will visit the children unto the third and fourth generations yes and now chapter 10 goes into the genealogy of the sons of noah shim ham and japheth's sons were born to them after the flood the sons of japheth were gomer magog now when you're thinking of magog in ezekiel 38 you have to realize it's speaking of a territorial area because the sons of noah wherever they settled the places became known for them and were named after them this is why jews that later came to ashkenaz area up in german france area they're adopting the name of one of Yafith's sons the ashkenaz area so you'll see that here Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yevan, Tuval, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz. See, so this is the grandson of Yefeth. Rephat and Togarma. The sons of Yevan were Elisha, Tarshish. Remember, this is where Paul goes. Tarshish is uh, off the coast of Spain. This is where Tarshish ended up settling. Kittim, which is Italy. The ships of Kittim came from Rome and Dodanim. These were the islands of the nations, so across the Mediterranean. They were divided in their lands. And Dodanim settled along the Sea of Gihon, each according to its language and according to their families in their own nations. Each son became a different nation. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Shiva, Havilah, Safta, Rama, Saftka, and the sons of Rama were Shivta and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. So Nimrod is the grandson, or great grandson, of actually grandson of Ham, who was in the who was the first powerful ruler on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Adonai. This is why people say, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Adonai. And it is said that part of the sin of Canaan was that he stole the priestly garment from Noah that had been passed down from Adam. And with this priestly robe came a lot of power. And it was meant to be passed on to Shem, Canaan stole it, gave it to Cush, who gave it to his son, Nimrod. And Nimrod, in the beginning, was a fairly good man. But once he put on that robe, it was like things changed, and he became much more powerful and much more egocentric. And uh, it says he became a uh, mighty man. Uh, this is a term that's likened to many of the giants, even. And we know the offspring of Ham, all four sons, had giants spring up in their lineage. Abs that's right. Very good. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Nimrod became a mighty hunter before the Lord. His kingdom began with Babel, Arech, Akkad. You've heard of the Akkadians? 
and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Shinar was a huge big valley up uh, in just south of the uh, Euphrates. Asher went out from that land and built Nineveh, the city, Rechavot, Kalach, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalach. That one is a great city. Mitzrayim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt, fathered the Ludim and the Ananim, the Lahavim and the Naftukim, the Patsurim and the Kasluchim, from which came the Philistine. Remember the giants that arose out of the Philistines? Canaan fathered Zidion, his firstborn, Chet, Yevusai, the Emerai, the Girgashai, the Hivai, the Arki, and the Sinai, and the Arvadi, and the Samari, and the Hamati. Afterwards, the families of Canaan were dispersed. The borders of the Canaanite were from Zidion as you go towards Gerar to Azah as you go towards Sidim, Amora, Adma, Zevoim, and Lesha. So this is very important for us to understand the migrations of people from the flood and how they dispersed because every prophecy and every place where Israel uh, deals with other nations after this, you're only going to understand their origins and where they came from if you kind of mentally can understand their migration routes. These were the descendants of Ham according to their families and languages in their lands and in their nations. Children were also born to Shem, ancestor of all the descendants, Eber. Now Eber is where we get the word Ivrit from, which is the root of Hebrew. Do you know when they migrated to Tarshish, a lot of the uh, ancient Israel migrated to areas of Yafeth's sons because they knew that they would be able to live in harmony with them there. And they named the main river that they poured it in Eber, the Eber River. And then it became the Iberian Peninsula, the whole peninsula of Spain, before the Greeks ever called it Hispar uh, Hispania. It was known as the Iberian Peninsula, which included Spain and Portugal. Eber, you see throughout, wherever these Hebrews traveled, they would leave this name, Eber. The sons of Shem were Elam, which became the area of Persia, Asher, which became Syria or Assyria, the Chaldeans, Arkshapad, and Lud became the Libyans, and also Aram. Remember at Passover, we are to say that our father was a wandering Arami. So this tells you that Abraham and uh, specifically Jacob, who traveled up to um, his uncle Laban's house. This was in the area of Aram. Abraham, uh, a descendant from Arbaxa, you know, um, one of Shem's children. That's right. And Aram became an area known for like Lebanon, where it was named after Laban. And so this is why Jacob, when he wanders from Laban's house, we are reminding ourselves that we're a descendant of this wandering Arami. It's a relation to, um, and it's actually a, a misnomer because that term that in that verse is slightly mistranslated. It's actually referring that he was running from the Arami, not that he was a wandering Arami. He's coming from that land uh, where Laban resides. The sons of Aram were Uts, Hol, Geter, Mash. Archipad, he's the 12th generation, like Bill is saying, from Adam, that Abraham is coming through this lineage. Ab Abraham is actually the 20th uh, generation from Adam. Archipad is the 12th in the priestly lineage. He fathers Shalach, and Shalach fathers Eber. So Eber, who becomes the namesake of the Ivrit nation, is the 14th generation from Adam. To Eber were born two sons. One was the name Peleg given, which means division, because during his lifetime the earth was divided. It means their migration routes, they're spreading out. His brother's name was Yoktan. Yoktan fathered Almodad, Shelaf, Hazar Mavat, Yerach, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Oval, Avmael, and Sheva. Ophir, Havilah, and Yovav. All these were the sons of Yoktan, and their territory stretched out from Mesha as you go towards Shafa to the mountains in the east. These were the descendants of Shem, according to their families and languages in their lands and in their nations. These were their families 
these were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations. From these, the nations of the earth were divided up after the flood. And now we come to the final chapter, which talks about the Tower of Babel and how 70 languages were confused there, from which 70 separate nations speaking different languages arose. So when we have the 70 bulls that are sacrificed during the week of Sukkot, these are atoning for these 70 nations from which everybody has their origins. So it's a type of atonement for the whole world, for the goyim. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, The whole earth used to be one language. What was that one language? Ivrit. It was Hebrew. That's right. Everyone was of the same word. The word here is sefa. It's because sheen, pei, and he, which is like a divine mouth. The sheen, you could think of the shekinah, and the pei is a mouth, and the he is being revealed. So the one language, even in the word sefa, when you read it in the Hebrew, you're seeing the picture language come out, like we were talking about this morning, about a divine mouth being revealed. The one language came from that one divine mouth. It came about as they traveled from the east, they found a plain called the plain of Shinar. And they lived there. And they said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and bake them in fire. So they had bricks for building stone and clay for mortar. They said, and we learned from our study of uh, Jubilees last year, it took one year for one man to carry his bricks up to where the people could use them. This is how high this was. The base was three and a half miles across. And imagine traveling for one year just to deliver your bricks. Come, let us make bricks and bake them in the fire. So they would bake them and carry them up and building this tower, which has its top reaching up into heaven so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. Adonai came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Adonai said, look, the people are united. They have all have a single language and see what they're starting to do. Now, what's amazing is the... European Union has patterned its building after the unfinished ziggurat, the unfinished Tower of Babel. And their motto is a mockery to God because they said, from many languages, one people. See, before it was one language and many people came out of that. They're reversing what God did at the Tower of Babel and they're basically saying, in your face, God, we're going to become a one world government the way that Nimrod intended. And this is the motto of the European Union headquarters. Adonai came down to see the city and the tower the people were building and said, look, the people are united. They all have one single language and look what they're doing. At this rate, nothing they set out to accomplish will be impossible for them. Could it be even that this was a type of portal like the CERN uh, that they were establishing in their day? Hey, yeah. think about this. This is exciting. We have TV today. We get to watch this tower come. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Babylon is going to fall. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Come out of her, my people, that you participate not in her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Just like the warning that God gave Noah in the days of old, God is giving us. Come out of her, my people. Come out of this false system. So from there, Adonai scattered them all over the earth. And they stopped building the city. For this reason, it is called Babel, which means confusion. Because there, Adonai confused the languages of the whole earth. And the system of Babylon has confused the whole earth. It has blinded the minds of men. And this is the false system that we're to come out of. It has caused confusion because it has promoted the doctrines of error instead of truth. I've told you this before. Um, I actually have a friend who was a missionary pilot who met a group of Africans as they were flying around there that actually they claimed their language they had no Christian or Jewish background all the way back to the Tower of Babel where the languages were confused that is in their story. yeah that was an isolated tribe in Africa right yeah yeah, yeah. amazing <coughs> so then it goes into the genealogy of Shem after talking about the Tower of Babel and the languages being confused. And he was 100 years old when he fathered Archipad, 
two years after the flood. After Archipad was born, Shem lived another 500 years and had other sons and daughters. And what it's doing is it's establishing the priestly lineage down now from Noah's son Shem that's going to uh, go to Abraham's day. Because next week, the Torah portion is Lake Lecha, all about Abraham. So what it's doing is it's tying now this generation, this time period of Noah, and bringing us down to Abraham's day. Archipad had Shalak, and Shalak had Eber, the 14th generation from Adam. Eber had Peleg, the 15th. Peleg had Rui, the 16th. And Reu had Serug. And Serug had Nehor. And Nehor had Terak, which was Abraham's father, 19th generation from Adam. And after Terach was born, Nahor lived another 119 years and had sons and daughters. And we learned a lot in the book of Jasher about Terach and his prestige that he gained as a prince for Nimrod and how he was in control of all of the idols um, that were created for this Babylonian system. And this is what Abraham came out of. Terach lived 70 years and fathered Avram, Nahor, and Haran. Here is the genealogy of Terach. Terach fathered Avram and Nehor and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Now remember, Haran was the one that died in the fire in the Shinar Valley. So Abraham ends up marrying Haran's daughter, Sarai and takes Lot, her brother, under his wing. He's basically living out the Torah, taking care of his brother who has died, taking care of both of his children. This is why, you know, in the Eastern cultures, we oftentimes call um, our cousins brother and sister. And so this is why it was not a lie that he would refer to Sarah as his sister. He's not saying that she's my immediate descendant, but he's basically saying, you know, we're that close of family. And it's a very common term in the East. You say it in the Lakota as well? No, I mean, even in America, we say, well, that's my second or my third cousin. Like right. We're still alive in this era. Yeah, these cultures call them brothers and sisters with one another. So Haran died before his father Terach in the land where he was born in Ur of the Kazdim. And this is where all the Torah talks about that. But we get the rest of the story from Jasher. Then Avram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Avram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran. He was the father of Milcah and Yishkah. Sarah was barren. She had no child. Terak took his son Avram and his son Haran's son Lot and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Avram's wife, and they left Ur of the Kazdim. Now what this isn't telling you is this is after... Nimrod had thrown Abraham in the furnace and, in, and Nimrod lived through it. And it was a great testimony of the land. We are getting part of the story, just the surface story here. He also threw Haran in the furnace. Haran did not live through it because his motives were not as pure as Abraham's. So Nimrod threw Abram and Haran in the furnace yes. at the same time? Oh, no, one after the other. Okay. First Abraham went in, and then he came out totally unscathed. And then uh, he had an issue with Haran, um, and he threw him in, and but he did burn up. Haran was the, wasn't it that Haran uh, actually reported That's Abraham right. for uh, believing only in one God. Mm -hmm. And so that brought him in front of Nimrod, and... Nimrod says into the furnace, and here's Abram in the furnace, and the king uh, Nimrod says to Haram, uh, uh, "What is your your good?" You know. That's right. And he didn't have well, some... like Abraham. Oh, you do well. Let's throw you in then. <laughs> exactly, because he was an idol worshiper, and his faith was not as strong as Abraham and the one true God. And so, in this Torah portion, we can see from Noah, from the first verse of Noah, how he had grace in the eyes of the Lord, all the way to Abraham, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we see God showing his grace, his unmerited favor in preserving a remnant through Noah and through Abraham. This Torah portion is beautiful in the fact that it really reveals God's character. It's not about the destruction. It's about the saving grace of God. 
and the motives of our heart. So with that, let's stand and we will close with prayer and enjoy a wonderful fellowship lunch together. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for revealing the rest of the story to us. Your goodness and your mercy endures forever. And we thank you for preserving a remnant people who are preserved in your image, Father, to be your bride without spot or blemish. We thank you for the Torah that has been preserved through these people. Noah preserved your oracles that were passed down from Enoch and Methuselah, and Abraham learned from Shem, Melchizedek, the oracles of the priesthood, and passed them on to his lineage, Yitzhak and Yaakov, our forefathers. And so we thank you, Lord, for reintroducing us to your ways and to your Torah instruction, in which is life and blessings and health and wellness and as Yeshua said life even more abundantly so we thank you father for teaching us we love you and we ask your blessing upon the food that we're about to receive in your holy name we pray amen